Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, before we talk about uh, lecture material, let's talk a little bit about the final project. Hopefully you submitted your idea for your final project uh, last night. You gave us an idea about where you'd like to be by the exam period, which is when you're going to present your final project. And you also told us about how you're going to break it down into three weekly deliverables. And each one of those deliverables is a stepping stone towards your final project. Um, I mentioned this before, but it's probably worth repeating. Um, once you start to get into the actual implementation of your final project, you might find that the next deliverable no longer makes sense. That's fine. Um, if you submit next, well, if you submit next Monday night uh, your first deliverable and it's different from what you wrote in yesterday's submission, that's fine. Just tell us. I changed my deliverable because I realized this wasn't reasonable and this made more sense as a step towards my, my final project. Right? We're not holding you to what you initially proposed, but just trying to incentivize you to think about how best to break your project down into bite-sized chunks. Any questions about final project weekly deliverables? Yes? I will when I get around to writing it this summer, but at the moment it does not. The best thing to do is to open pyrosim.py and just march through all the methods in there, right? They all pretty much have the same form, send x, where x is a joint or an object or a sensor or a motor. Pretty much everything is in there. I think throughout the 10 assignments I've introduced you to almost everything. The only things you haven't seen is that there are some additional sensors in there that you haven't made use of yet, I think. We've made use of the touch sensors, the proprioceptive sensors, which return a value proportional to the current angle of a joint. So uh, we've introduced the position sensor, so your robot knows how far it is along the x, y, and z coordinate, right? Um, what else? Light sensors. Uh, we introduced that when we introduced phototaxis, so the light sensor returns a value commensurate to how close the robot is to the light source. Am I missing any other sensors? Ray sensor. Sorry? Ray sensor. Ray. Red sensor. Ray. The ray, uh, sorry, the ray sensor, that's right. So the ray sensor is interesting. Actually, let's talk about the ray sensor for a moment. If you remember back to the position sensor, unlike all the other sensors you'd seen up to this point, the position sensor returns three vectors. What are those three vectors? You remember when you collect the sensor data back from a position sensor, you can ask for s equals zero, which is the first vector, s equals one, which is the second vector, or s equals two, which is the third vector. What are those three vectors? The XYZ coordinates. The XYZ coordinates, right? So some sensors return a single vector, like a touch sensor gives you back one vector, which is whether that touch sensor fired yes or no at each time step of the evaluation period. Position sensor gives you back three vectors, the X, Y, and Z coordinate of the object in which the position sensor is sitting. A ray sensor actually gives you, back, uh, gives you back four vectors. The first vector is distance, how long that beam is um, until it hits something, if it hits anything at all. The second, third, and fourth vector returned by the ray sensor are the RGB, uh, RGB values of the object it hits. So if you have uh, your robot here, and it's got a ray sensor coming out here, and it hits another object in the environment, and this object is all red, then the ray sensor will return the length of this vector, uh, the length of the ray, and all red, no green, and no blue. So you can extract from the ray information distance information, and also something about the color of the object it hit, right? So this is as close as we get in this course to vision. 
If you put a bunch of ray sensors on different objects, you can start to approximate you know, something that can see pretty well. Okay, um, the other one I don't think we've talked about is the vestibular sensor. I might have mentioned this. Did we talk about the vestibular sensor? It's the orientation sensor, right? Actually, we talked about it when we discussed the Resilient Machines project last week. So if you place a vestibular sensor inside an object, uh, and that object tilts away from its default orientation, Remember, when you create an object at time step zero, that's its default orientation. If it tips away from it, the angle between, I need another eraser here. All right, this is my vertical vector. The further away an object tilts from the vertical vector, the angle between the vertical vector and that object, that angle is what's returned by the vestibular sensor. So the vestibular sensor is very useful for selecting for things like balance. So some of you are working on a biped, I think, and you want to see what happens when the biped falls over. You can penalize the biped by placing a vestibular sensor in the biped. If it starts to fall over and that angle becomes too great, you build that into your fitness function somehow, right? So you could select you could create a fitness function for the biped that says maximize D and minimize the value returned by the vestibular sensor, which hopefully will give you a biped that's able to keep upright while it's walking. It's also useful for robots other than the biped. Yes? It's a single axis. It's a single axis. So it gives you back a single number, right? And it's just the angle between the vertical axis and whatever the orientation is of the object in which it's sitting. That's it. So it can't tell you whether the object is tilting left and right or forward or, or back. It just returns a single number, which is how far the object is tilting away from the vertical axis. Make sense? So it doesn't, you don't need to have an object that starts sort of pointing up, right? You could have, you could place a vestibular sensor in the main body of your quadruped. And if it starts to tilt like this, then the vestibular sensor will report values greater than zero. Make sense? OK. So I think that pretty much covers everything that's in PyroSim at the, the moment. I apologize. I don't have a, a, an API for it yet. But I think with the vestibular sensor and now the ray sensor, you know pretty much everything there is inside of PyroSim. OK. You will also find um, in some of your projects that you need things that aren't in PyroSim. Uh, for example, objects that don't move. Some of you want to evolve robots that move over rugged terrain. The easiest way to make rugged terrain is to embed some objects in the ground, and the robot has to walk over those objects. There is no easy way in PyroSim at the moment to make an object immovable. If you want that, write me an email. and. I will cross my fingers that you're not working on a Windows machine, in which case I can give you back another version of PyroSim that will allow you to create immovable objects. If you're working on a Windows machine and you want immovable objects, it's possible. Email me and I can, I can talk you through it. OK. Uh, if there are other things that come up that you would like to try and do in the simulator, but there's no easy way to do it, write me an email, and we'll either I can do it for you, or we'll find a, a workaround for it. Make sense? Any other questions about the final project? No? Okay, so again, we're working our way through open problems in the field of evolutionary robotics. We finished last time with the discussion of the transferability project which is the most recent attempt to try and cross the reality gap. Uh, probably um, one of the biggest uh, open problems in evolutionary robotics uh, at the moment. We're going to switch gears now, and in lecture 19 and 20, we're going to look at two uh, solutions. These both come out of uh, my research group to deal with another open problem in the field of evolutionary robotics in particular, but robotics in general which is how do we scale up the design, optimization, and manufacture of robotics. So everything you've seen up to this point in the course is usually me saying something like, 
professor so-and-so uh, and her two grad students you know, did this project, they wrote a paper on it, and then that was the end of that project, and on to the next one, right? So instead of uh, one person or a few people working on a robotics project, could we use web technologies, the cloud, all the other stuff that's out there now, and bring that into robotics to try and scale things up in a particular way, which is to invite large numbers of non-roboticists to help us design, optimize, and manufacture robots. That's what we're going to look at in lecture 19 uh, and 20. You may be asking yourself, why would you bother doing that? How can a non-expert possibly help here? Um, any, any chess experts here? Chess aficionados? Who knows who or what the current world chess champion is? You can probably guess from the way I phrased that question that this is a bit of a trick question. Okay, it involves a computer. Turns out that the current chess champion is not a computer or a single computer. It's definitely not a single person. It is a team of pretty good chess players, and they get together, they come up with a strategy, so they try a few moves, they pass that to their chess programs on their laptops, and the laptops work through the possible repercussions of those actions, and through the combined thinking of the human members of the team and the laptops, they propose their next move. And the team responds and so on and so forth. So uh, for those of you that are interested, this is now known as modern chess or uh, centaur chess. Centaur is this mythical creature which is half human and half something else, right? So it turns out that in chess, uh, putting large numbers of people together with large numbers of computers seem to do better than single human grandmasters or single computer grandmasters. Whether that situation will hold forever, who knows, but at the moment, um, that's the best there is in, in chess. Is that the same thing they deep mind in Actually not in that case, right? In that case, it was just one big computer, right? So we'll see if maybe... T, uh, centaur teams of Go players will be the next innovation in, in Go. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at now in, uh, to, to address this issue about how do we scale things up, right? You are a single individual. You've spent 10 weeks building your quadruped and trying to get it to do photo taxes. You're going to spend the remaining three and a half weeks trying to get your robot to do something, other, uh, something else. And then at the end of those three and a half weeks, Right? I will start again with a fresh group of students next spring. Right? How do we sort of build momentum where we have projects, uh, robots that become ever more intelligent, able to behave in ever more challenging environments, and they are helped along by ever-growing numbers of human helpers and teachers and guiders and coders and so on. That's, that's where we're going. Okay, let's start with the DotBot project. Uh, this was a project carried out by uh, one of my former PhD students, Mark Wege. And the first thing that Mark did was to take uh, his robot simulator, convert it to JavaScript, and have it run all in the browser. And this, this led to the DotBot project. Um, if you have a machine here, you can actually try it out. There's the URL up there, or you can write down the URL and try it uh, at your leisure. Um, as the name implies, in the DotBot project, you click on a dot and drag to another dot, pick another dot, drag to another dot. I've created my robot. Now I click Go, and uh, the DotBot take, uh, code takes my design builds a robot in the physics engine, which is running in my browser. And you can see the robot is moving, so we have a controller for this robot. So in the DotBot project, people design the body plans, as you just saw me do over here. And for every body plan created by a human participant, we create a single hill climber that's associated with that morphology. So throughout the DotBot project, people have created thousands of different morphologies, 
And for each one of those morphologies, there is also a hill climber. So if we have 1,300 morphologies, we have 1,300 hill climbers. How do you think, from the short demonstration I just showed you, how do you think Mark converted this drawing to uh, a simulated robot? Let's start with the body first, and then we'll talk about the controller. Mm -hmm. It would just say the distance between each point as length L, and then each point is a joint, and the joint acts on each point? Uh, pretty close. So not quite cylinders. We've got rectangular solids in this place, but that in, in this case, but that's not that different from what you've been doing. Each line in the drawing, as you can see, becomes uh, a segment, if you want. Let's call it a segment. You can see that at each dot over here, we get a cube on this side. Why, is there, why are there segments and cubes? Why not just segments? The cubes are a little bit of a hint. You can obviously see the objects. What about the joints? There's motors in the joints, as always. But what are the joints? How do we, how do we derive the joints from this drawing? From the dots. From the dots, right? So wherever there's a dot, there is at least two segments arriving at that dot. For some dots, there is more than two segments arriving. So remember, a joint can only con uh, connect pairs of uh, objects together. So if we have three objects, we're going to have to do something else. So what Mark came up with is just place an additional object where each of the dots are, and then wherever a dot and a line intersect, place a joint there. Right? So in this case here, which corresponds to this point here, we've got three objects that are arriving. We have the fourth object, which is the cube. Connect this object to this object with a joint, this object to this object with a joint, and this object to this object with a joint. Right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay. Mark used a pretty straightforward. Uh, you used a pretty straightforward controller. What he did was he took all of the joints that existed in the robot and supplied a sinusoidal signal to those joints. So there's no neural network here, just a sinusoidal pattern which is supplied to the motor. Some of the motors are receiving this sinusoidal pattern, some of the other motors are receiving a sinusoidal pattern that is in antiphase to this pattern. It's a little tricky to see, but sometimes you can see it if you look carefully. Let's create another robot here. So some of the, some of the joints here are moving together using this pattern. The other joints are moving together using this pattern, and those two sets of joints are moving in antiphase to one another, right? Which allows the lifting of one part and the pushing down of another part, and vice versa, right? We need some opposition of, of movement. So a greatly simplified controller here. No sensor neurons, no hidden neurons, no motor neurons, no synapses. Just N motors. Some of them following this pattern, and some of them following this pattern. Make sense? OK. I mentioned that for every body plan that's created, there is a hill climber that's associated with it. So the hill climber means we're doing some optimization here. So the hill climber is trying to optimize the, these sets of patterns so that the robot moves as far from the red dot as possible. What do you think the genome is here? What is the genome encoding? If there's no synapses, there's no neurons, just two sets, subsets of motors, some following this pattern and the others following the other pattern. Exactly, right? So if we have a robot that has n motors in it, the genome has, is a vector of length n. It's a binary vector, where a zero 
denotes that that motor, the ith motor, follows this pattern, and a 1 denotes that the ith motor follows that pattern. That's it, right? Every time I click go, I am performing one more iteration of the hill climber. Remember, the hill climber starts with a parent genome, which is a random bit string in this, key, this case. Whenever I click go, the program copies that binary vector, flips a couple of the bits through mutation, tries out the new uh, genome. If the child does better than the parent, if it gets further from the origin, as you can see it happens to actually be doing in this case, the child replaces the parent, and so on. Make sense? Okay, so this is fun up to a point if you do this on your own, but things become really fun if you're doing this in a group, right? So this is Centaur Robotics now, where a group of humans are going to be creating body plans, and every time those humans click go, the JavaScript is going to simulate and advance one iteration of the hill climber associated with that robot. Make sense? Okay. Uh, I'm going to flip around a fair bit in the slide deck for lecture 19 here, so bear with me. Here's a figure we came up with to try and show how this works. We have user 1 up here. User 1 comes to the DotBot site. They draw this robot. They click go, which means now their computer takes over. The computer performs one iteration of the hill climber, and this robot moves this distance away from the origin. What do you think the red and the blue segments represent here? In phase and out of phase, right? So this picture sort of shows there's a particular controller here. User 1 clicks go again, and now if you compare the reds and the blues here, you'll see that they're different. Same body, different controller. Robot gets a little bit further. While user 1 is doing this, the other users on the website can actually see what's happening. So user 387 takes this design and clicks go on their computer. And computer 387 advanced to the hill climber by one step that was started on computer 1. Right? So the robots and the hill climbers aren't tied to any one user or any one computer. They can, whoever creates this robot and clicks go, they advance one iteration of the hill climber on their, their machine. Make sense? Okay, so while that's going on, user two makes a completely different design, does the same thing, they advance the hill climber a little bit, uh, user 4 sees this design and thinks it's promising. They click go on their machine. User 1142 clicks go on their machine. And suddenly this robot is getting further than this one. User 1 is also still in the game. Realizes that maybe uh, his design is not ideal. Uh, abandons his design. Takes over user 2's design and innovates on her design a little bit. Says, I get it, this is a pretty good body plan. It's better than this one, but maybe I can improve on it a little bit just by making it bigger. Dotbot cannot tell the difference between, or cannot tell the fact that these are similar designs. So when this design is made by user one for the first time, it creates a new hill climber associated with this robot. User one advances the hill climber a little bit. User 14 advances the hill climber further, and user 92 advances it even further, and at this point the game ends, and user 92 is the winner. They produced the robot that moved the fastest out of all the robots that have been seen so far. Okay, that's the, that's the game. We wanted to see, what we wanted to investigate in this experiment is the relationship between the evolutionary dynamics, and by evolutionary dynamics I mean how the hill climbers get better over time. But we wanted to see how the evolutionary dynamics were also being influenced by the social dynamics, right? While someone is doing something, everyone else is watching and deciding whether there is potential in that design versus their own design, right? So there's sort of a market of robots that are being traded by users. They can work on their own design, they can take over somebody else's, they can 
uh, improve upon it, and, and so on. There are no intellectual property rights in this game, right? You can just take over anybody else's design at any, any time. Okay, so is that social dynamics helping us with our ultimate goal, which as always is just produce a robot that moves as far from the origin as quickly as possible? Are all those social dynamics helping or are they actually hurting? Right? You put large groups of humans together and sometimes they work well together and sometimes they don't work so well together, and they do worse than if they had worked on their own. Right? So sometimes known as the wisdom of crowds and the madness of, of crowds. Right? So is there synergistic, or is there synergy going on among people? Are they collectively discovering the best robots together by riffing on each other's designs? Or are they sort of pulling each other in different directions? And what might have looked like a good solution the crowd got distracted by this design, which might be good in the long term, but maybe if you kept running a hill climber against this robot, it would have ultimately done better, right? If user one had not been distracted by user two's design, abandoned it uh, so, that, so that user one abandoned their design and took over user two's design, maybe if user one had been left alone, they would have ultimately done better than getting bogged down in all this social uh, distraction. Okay, so how do we test that? Let's take our system and now let's put up walls between the users. So the users are still doing exactly the same thing. They're coming to the website, user one creates their robot, they click go a couple times, they work on their hill climber, eventually user one gives up on this design, makes a different design, works on this hill climber for a while, and so on and so forth. While they're doing that, User two is doing the same thing in their little box, or their little cubicle. And user n is doing the same thing over, over here. So still, lots of computers and lot of, lots of people, but they're dissociated from one another. We're going to compare the results between these two groups in a moment. Before we do, one last little twist on this group of humans and computers is that for example, if, uh, I don't think I have it here uh, in this figure, if user two had not drawn this cross, but had instead drawn by accident the same design that had already been drawn by user one earlier. So if user two had drawn this, and then user two had clicked go on her machine, she would have advanced the hill climber that had already been started by user one. They wouldn't, she wouldn't know that, but she would be contributing to that, that hill climber. Right? The idea being that if there is some obvious design out there that the crowd tends to hit upon, even if they don't see it from the others, they're still all contributing to optimizing that one design. Make sense? Yes. Are users two, so like user two has like a one for its first design, and the rest of them are very similar to user one. User two, sorry, say that again, user two. So like the first robot looks like a one, right? This one. And then the rest of them look a lot like user one's robot. Or user oh yes, you're right, you're right. That is, a, that is a typo in the figure. So these here should look like this. Okay. My apologies. That's right, good fetch, meant to fix that, thank you. Okay, so that's uh, people working together, people working independently. And we made a third team. So these are both Centaur teams. We've got people and computers working together. People are making the robot bodies. Their computers are making the robot brains. Two teams. We had to, of course, introduce a third team, which is all machines. Right? So this is the completely automated team. No people here. We have uh, N computers here. And each computer is running a hill climber. But that hill climber is optimizing not just the brains of the robots, but also the bodies. We've seen a number of experiments so far in the course now where both the body and the brain of the robot was placed under evolutionary control. Did the same thing here, right? So the first two teams are centaur teams, mixtures of people and computers, and then all computers. Which of these three teams did better? 
Any ideas before I reveal the, the results? Okay. We hear one vote for the independent team. Do people agree, disagree? No takers? The computers will do better. Okay, right? This is an evolutionary robotics class. We're trying to get computers to evolve robots for us. Surely team number three is going to do better. Team three is the red line. Computers did terribly at this, this job. Now, there's a number of disclaimers to make about these results. As always in science, this was our first attempt. We could probably improve these three teams, and maybe the relative performances would change. But given what I've shown you so far, these are the results we got. So what we tried to do, first of all, was normalize the number of evaluations for all three teams. So we're plotting the performance of the best robot produced by each of the three teams as a function of evaluations, which is just how many simulated robots were tried out in the, the simulator. So these different, these different teams don't have any clear sort of number of, except for this team, these teams don't really have any clear sort of number of generations and you know, population size and so on because things are sort of more complicated. We were, just, we were just summing up the number of robots that had been evaluated by these three teams. Okay, so the computers on their own didn't do very well. They managed to evolve a robot that traveled 14 uh, unit distance away from the origin and then sort of ran out of gas. Blue is the social team, and green is the independent team, the team with all the, the individuals in uh, cubicles. You can see that the green team runs out here, the blue team keeps going. Uh, this was because uh, it took us a while to run this experiment. We were recruiting human subjects to the websites. It took us quite a while to get this data. At this point, um, we weren't quite sure whether blue was really doing better than green, it looked like it, but it was both were clearly doing better than the computers. So at this point, we'd already sort of proved our main hypothesis, which is that people can be non-experts, can be helpful in this domain. So we sort of stopped the experiment at this point, or at least turned off this part of the experiment, and any new users who found the DocBot website were placed into this team, where they were working together. And even much later, they were still making improvements. OK, there's a lot of details to this experiment, so I'm not going to go into more of the details. If we go back to the schedule for a moment, you'll see that for the DotBot project, I put up a two-minute uh, summary video that will sort of walk you through what I just said, and we'll provide a couple more details. Here's the actual research paper. If you want to tackle it in its entirety, that's great. The assigned reading for today is, like usual, just sort of the abstract in the intra introduction. So it's a pretty involved experiment. There's a lot going on there. But the main thing I want you to take away from this project for today is that inviting lots of non-experts into the design uh, and optimization of robots is possible. OK. Last thing we're going to look at in this project is why. Why did people help here? Why did the, why did the, the purely computational team do so poorly and the humans do so well? Presumably, the several hundred humans that helped out in this experiment were not all roboticists. Might have been a few roboticists in there, but we're pretty sure most of the people that came to the site were sort of casual web users who found this on Reddit and were sort of playing around with these these robots. What is it that the people are doing that's helpful? Creativity, I believe. Creativity? Creativity in what sense? Well, like a robot can't think of what else they want to think. But the robot can't come up with new innovative ideas and has to play it off of what it already knows. When you have a large group of people, they each come in with their own knowledge and their own unique perspective on the problem. Possibly. So maybe by bringing together lots of people, we were able to bring together lots of different ideas. And even if they aren't the best idea, it's at least a different idea. 
at least it's a different idea, right? So maybe the computers aren't thinking broadly enough, right? They get locked into some design and then they can't get out of it. My, my counter to your argument would be, let's just turn up the mutation rate. Let's get the computer to make really different robot bodies, right? We didn't do that, but maybe that would help. Other ideas? Okay, possibly, right? So maybe we're by making it into a game, we're trying to we're we're indirectly incentivizing people to come up with really different ideas. Maybe you can actually, for the mathematicians in the room, you can try and do the combinatorics about how many. Let's see, do I have the actual grid here somewhere? You can do the combinatorics of how many possible robots you can make. It turns out it's a very large number. For each one of those possible robots in this space, there are also a very, very large number of controllers. We've never done the combinatorics all the way to the end and figured out the total number of morphologies and all possible controllers. Um, if anybody wants to tackle that, we would love to hear from you. Short answer is it's a really, really, really big, big number. Right? So it's not too hard to sort of turn up the mutation rate and get the computers to also explore very diverse areas in this very large space. So my guess is it's not just about the fact that they're exploring lots of different ideas. I don't have like an exact answer, but I, I would assume it has to do with the, if you look at the graph, you can see that the robot's graph is very steady as the, any interaction with humans pretty much it's flat, a constant, and then few jumps. So there's things happening at these times. Something is right. Something's happening at those points. Are those right? timestamps? Like, could you attribute that to being like this got to the front page of Reddit and then jumped? And I, then I don't think it's the amount of usage of the website. I think it's more of what you're seeing in, for example, this picture. So people are working on designs like this for a while, and then someone draws this. And then some people say, wait a second, there's a, there's a whole other area of the search space that we hadn't thought of before. The nice thing about this being um, a website is when I go on the road and show this to high school students or middle school students, we play the dot bot game. And they open up their laptops and we play it as a game. I say, OK, you make the best robot you can. These are high schoolers, in some cases middle schoolers probably not expert roboticists. Uh, the last time I did this, a middle schooler, she drew a ring, which turned out to actually do pretty well. We went back and looked in the data. There had never been a ring before. There were about 30 middle schoolers. They all saw the ring. They saw her draw the ring, and then everyone started to draw versions of a ring, bigger rings, smaller rings, vertical rings, diagonal rings. They all seemed to do quite well, right? So it was interesting to see in person someone hit on some part of this very large dimensional space that we hadn't thought of before. And with enough of her peers helping out and contributing uh, cre creative and computational effort, they came up with a ring robot that traveled quite far from the origin. Right? So it definitely is something to do with creativity and being able to think about unique solutions. Again, we can get computers to explore large parts of the space, but why the ring? Why was it that she drew that particular motif of all the other infinite possible mo no motifs, near infinite motifs you could imagine in this space? Is it because it's a shape that's familiar to us in other games? Shape that's familiar to us. Now we're getting somewhere. OK. Here is, uh, here is the best, five best designs produced by the collaborative, uh, I forget what M stands for, the collaborative team, the independent team, and oh, M is machine. So collaborative humans and machines, independent humans and their machines, and just the machines. Best five designs produced by this Centaur team, best five designs produced by this Centaur team, and the best five designs produced by the machine team. Spot the difference. Clearly, the human designs are very different. 
even in both groups, compared to the machine designs? How are they different? Definitely, definitely simpler and less grid-like. Grid yes. There are many, many more, again, in this near infinite space, there are many more of these kinds of things than these kinds of things. It's not just simplicity. There's other things that are different between the human designs and the computer designs. Is it the similarity between them? Like they're, they're definitely similar, right? You can see that a lot of them are variations on a theme. What is that theme, aside from simplicity? Symmetry. Right? Thank you. Every single one of the human designs is bilaterally symmetric. Not just symmetric, but bilaterally symmetric in the sense that I can take a line and cut every design in half and flip one half over onto the other half and they match, right? There is nothing on the DotBot site that says, please make bilaterally symmetric robots. Why does the crowd, even when they're working independently, right? So this design did not influence these. Again, assuming these came from different users, and I'm pretty sure they did. Why? Why is the crowd converging on bilaterally symmetric designs? Humans tend to like symmetric things, yes. Maybe like, I'm symmetrical, I walk well, so. I'm symmetrical, I walk well, you're all symmetrical, you all walk well, every legged animal I see out there is bilaterally symmetric, and it works well, walks well. If it's not bilaterally symmetric, because someone's walking across campus in a cast, they don't walk as fast, right? You've been seeing that pattern, uh, if you're a middle schooler, for whatever, 15, well, 15 years, we've been seeing it for quite a while, right? It's baked in there somehow. You might not, be, the users might not have been aware of it when they were doing it, but if we ask them to make good robots, they're making a prediction. If I create a body plan and throw computational effort at it, if I try and optimize a controller for it, which of these designs is more likely to be evolvable, right? Is it which, which of these designs is evolution most likely to find a good controller for, right? If I had asked you that question, you probably would have known intuitively that these are more evolvable than, than these. Are these just different physical bodies or different models? Uh, just so we get this picture. The first and the third machine generated ones are... The first, and the, yeah, that's right. These are identical. I think, again, that's a typo. We were trying to get five unique morphologies. You're right, another typo. Thank you. We should have you proofread all of our papers. Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, this idea that somehow people have this implicit, uh, implicit intuitions about structure, motion, and behavior, right? We're all sort of budding roboticists because we are adaptive machines. We interact with adaptive machines all day, every day. That's really what the DotBot project was designed to do. Can we elicit, can we draw out the latent intuition in the crowd? Right? If we're going to try and scale things up by attracting large groups of non-experts, they're really not non-experts. They're experts, just they may not know it. Right? It's we have to be able to get at what it is that they, they know. Okay, that's the DotBot project. So we wanted to see whether people had an intuition about designing robot morphologies. Now we're going to switch and look at another project, a Twitch Plays Robotics project. This project was also headed up by uh, one of my former PhD students who also took this class as an undergraduate uh, several years uh, ago. Um, so let's start with the name of the project. Um, everybody know Twitch TV? Twitch TV, one of, uh, millions of people go and watch other people play video games and watch other people do all sorts of other things. Uh, there was, a few years ago, uh, a Twitch channel called Twitch Plays Pokemon, where you had the little Pokemon game uh, in the video stream. And in the chat window, people could vote on what the game character would do next. So the group was collectively voting on what the game character would do next. 
So we took that basic principle, Twitch plays X, and we adapted it for robotics. So what you'll see in a moment in the Twitch Plays Robotics project is we took our virtual robot running on a laptop here on campus, live streamed it to Twitch, where large groups of people could observe a single robot, and they could type in chat stuff that influenced how the robots, or they, they typed chat that influenced the robot. So they were talking to the robot. Okay, that's the basic idea and the origin of the name. Let's, uh, let's come at this project from a different direction. This was a talk I gave on this project at a conference, so it's got a very different, uh, a different uh, title. You'll notice that there's another problem in here, the symbol grounding problem. So the Twitch Plays Robotics project was designed to solve or to help with two problems. The first problem is the scalability problem. How do we scale up so that tens of thousands of people are helping us design robots? The Twitch Plays Robotics project was also designed to help solve the symbol grounding problem. We actually mentioned the symbol grounding problem way back at the beginning of the course. Anybody remember? No? Let's see if I can tweak your memory. Anybody remember the Chinese room? OK, so um, the Twitch Plays Robotics Project is going to tackle an issue that we haven't talked about in this course so far, which is language. How do we teach robots language? We'll actually see another attempt to teach robots language in a couple lectures from now. Let's start with the symbol grounding problem. So you're speaking to a machine. The machine doesn't speak English. So all it hears is random sounds. It's trying to translate those sounds. It treats them as symbols. It's trying to turn those symbols around, replace some of the symbols with other symbols, give you back different symbols, and hope that those new symbols you treat as a cogent response to the question you asked the machine. Right? So we have a machine that is, uh, it's got some software inside the machine, and the machine is saying, if you see these symbols, replace them with these symbols, and so on and so forth. So you are replacing symbols with other symbols, but there's a problem here, the symbol grounding problem, and that problem is as follows. Let's forget about computers learning English for a moment. Let's imagine that you want to learn a foreign language. Um, some, a friend of yours who speaks that language says one word in that foreign language. You hear that word, you look it up in a dictionary, the foreign language dictionary, but that dictionary is written in the foreign language. So you hear a symbol, you look up that symbol, and the description of that symbol is written in other symbols that you don't understand. This is the same problem that a machine will face if you're trying to teach it English. It doesn't speak English. You have to give it, it's got to get started somehow. So you take the definition, which is written as a bunch of other symbols you don't understand. You take the first symbol in the description. You go look up that symbol in the same dictionary. Its definition is written in a bunch of other symbols. You take one of those symbols, so you jump around the dictionary. If you go long enough, you'll eventually come back to the same symbol you started with, right? You go round and around and around. This is a big problem that computers face. And I think, uh, not to pick on the psych project, there's been a lot of interesting work that's come out of it, but it really sort of, to me, highlights the inherent problem with the symbol, the inherent problem in the symbol grounding problem. So the psych project has been going since 1984. Um, psych is uh, in um, encyclopedia. So this is an attempt to take all human knowledge and write it down as a bunch of symbols, like Bill Clinton and United States President. And those symbols have some relationship between them, which is indicated by this predicate. Bill Clinton is a United States President. Tree is a general, or sorry, plant is a generalization of tree and so on. All trees are plants, Paris is the capital of France, and so on and so forth. So if we shove enough symbols into a computer and show how those symbols are related to one another using another symbol, the robot will start to understand, or the computer will start to understand knowledge and language and so on. 
project has been going since 1984. If you go check out the latest chatbot on the internet, you get a feel for how well we're doing with this problem, which is not very well at all. Right? Okay, um, the Chinese room problem, I won't go through this again, but this was an attempt to argue why this sort of approach won't really, really work. Okay, so what else can we do? If we want to try and teach robots English or Mandarin or French or any other language, how are we going to get them to understand language if they... It, how do we keep them from going round and round in circles? When they get a symbol of human language and they're trying to relate it to another symbol of human language, how do we keep them from going round and around and not making any progress? There's a similar problem in, um, in machine learning even to this day, which is we have a bunch of images and associated with each of those images is a symbol of human language, in this case English. Right? So, a deep neural network might learn to be able to take as input an image and give you back a symbol, but it's still not really understanding language very well. It's associating images and, and words. Okay, so how do people do this? How do children learn language when they don't have any language at all? Children are born without any inbuilt language understanding, right? They just start hearing words and eventually uttering them and so on. So how do children acquire language? Again, back to developmental psychology. There's been a study of this for a long time. Some aspects of this are known. Some are not known so well. Recent work in neuroimaging is starting to give us a clue about how humans acquire language. Again, we could dedicate a whole course to this topic, so I'm going to try and introduce this in a very, uh, uh, very surface way. Turns out that along the motor strip of your brain, which is the part right here, there is what some people call the homunculus. There's a little version of yourself in here. Um, if somebody taps your toes, the left part of your motor strip lights up. If somebody touches your chin, this part of your motor strip lights up. What's interesting is that information that's coming from different parts of your body are actually array, uh, arranged in linear sequence from your toes up to your face, at least, not the top of your head. Kind of, kind of interesting. So you can sort of think of this pattern actually existing in this part of your, your brain. Has nothing to do with language yet, right? We're just talking about the motor part of the brain. There was a recent paper published, uh, it was a paper published, I guess, a few years ago now, which started to show, and there's been many more papers since, that show that there is some fundamental relationship between language and felt experience. Literally, how you feel or experience the world. So what uh, Paul Muller and his colleagues did was to take a number of human uh, participants, put them in a functional mag magnetic resonance imager, or fMRI, and all they did is there was a speaker that was emitting people saying individual words like talk, lick, grasp, pick, walk, kick. And they were imaging uh, the brain. It turns out that when the subjects heard talk and lick, the face part of the homunculus would light up. So the brain would light up in the same place where if you do something with your face, like talk or lick, the same part of the brain lights up when you hear those words. When you hear arm-related words like grasp and pick, then the arm-related part of the motor strip uh, lights up. Walk and kick, the leg part lights up. Right? Kind, of, kind of interesting. We tend to think of language and mathematics as sort of this abstract enterprise that's dissociated from the body, it's kind of separate, right? It's very special. We tend to make a distinction between language and mathematics and other physical things like sports and eating and so on, right? They're separate. Who else made this distinction between abstract mental activities and the physical body stuff? Descartes, right? Remember, right in the first lecture, I warned you about this, right? Cartesian dualism. Descartes, over 300 years ago, said the body and the brain, or the mind or the soul, or Descartes, are separate things, right? It's been with 
the Western culture for over 300 years. It's hard for us to avoid it. Now, with brain imaging, we're starting to see that this Cartesian dualism isn't real, right? Language isn't really separated from the body. There is an intimate relation between them, and they meet at the intersection of what are known as motoric words. So you'll notice that all six of the words here are all verbs. So all motoric words are verbs, but not all verbs are motoric words. So you could say to motivate someone. So motivate is a verb, but it's not very motoric. Incentivize is a verb, but not very motoric. What, is a, what would be a good definition of a motoric word? What am I trying to get at here? Throw is a motoric word, exactly. Touch, all those sorts of things, right? Things that are directly related to physical experience, right? When you hear the word throw, the arm part, the arm related part of your motor strip lights up, right? When you say touch, the fingertip part of your motor strip probably lights up if we were to put you in an image in an imager, right? So motoric are things that are tightly coupled with our motors or our muscles. Not to judge them on their word choice, but why would they choose the word pick that's in the very because like when I think of pick, my immediate thought is choice. Okay. Why did they pick why why did they pick pick rather than choice? Because they want a specific thing or were they looking They chose pick for a very specific reason, which you you can tell by looking at the other five words here. Uh, close. They all rhyme. They all rhyme, right? Lick, pick, kick. Phonetically, they're very close to one another, right? So the auditory system, right, the part of your brain that's picking up the sound, very, very similar to each other, right? Rel pretty similar to each other. These three words, yet they light up very different parts of the brain, right? So they were choosing these words carefully to really try and justify the fact that these differences in the brain are real, right? They're not just caused because they sound different. They ended up activating different parts of the brain not because they sound different, but because they mean something very different. That's why they picked those words. Okay, so there seems to be this connection between felt experience and language. It turns out that there is other evidence for this, and this comes from linguistics. Um, for those of you that are interested in language and linguistics, George Lakoff has written some great books on this, uh, on this topic. And my favorite example that he gives are embodied metaphors. So let's imagine that you, are, you don't speak English very well, you're learning English, and a native English speaker is engaged in a conversation with you and you say something and the English speaker says back to you, don't jump to conclusions. You've never heard this idiom before, but most non-native English speakers can figure out what this idiom means. Why? So because they have a similar phrase in their language? Sometimes the answer is yes, but I've talked to a lot of people who speak other languages, and some languages don't have an equivalent of this idiom. Um, so for, for me, if I speak Chinese, I yep. might make it into English. I've never met another person who makes it into language. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, some, there's something similar about the use of this as well. Okay. Uh, but, so that helps, right, if there's yeah. something similar in your language. But, uh, but, uh, but I ask for, for that word when we are young. Um, it just gives me a meaning. It's like, like something um, that is uh, like to something that don't uh, don't lead to the conclusion, but just give uh, give give me a, 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 a just tell me like uh, to, uh, don't don't uh, don't talk about the conclusion right now. Okay, don't talk about it right now. What else does it sort of imply? This idiom. Ah, uh, right. So. Regardless of what your native tongue is, we all have jumped. You know what it feels like to jump, right? So what is it, right? There's some, suddenly this, this particular motoric word, jump, is forming a bridge between these two people who don't all speak the same language.
Yeah. That's right. So we're, we're clearly not talking about don't jump onto that red block, right? We're, we're mixing together motoric words and abstract words, conclusions, right? But what is it? What does this sort of idiom make you feel, right? What, how would you describe what the English speaker is counseling you not to do? What, are you, what, what did you do that caused the English speaker to say, don't jump to conclusions? You were probably jumping to a conclusion, but what do we mean by that? Ah, uh, counting your chickens before you had. Okay, let's stick with one embodied <laughs> metaphor at a time. Making assumptions. Making assumptions, right? So what? let's relate this back to, you're, you're using language, you have to, you have to answer me, right? But we're somehow, the, the English speaker is drawing the, uh, the other speaker back down to action, right? Let's come back out of language and let's connect in felt experience. What do you feel when you jump? And what do you feel when you jump to conclusions? It's kind of a positive What's happening? It's a jarring emotion. Like... Now we're getting somewhere, right? So when you jump, there's some sort of discontinuity, right? You leave the ground, and then a short time later, you hit the ground again, right? So we're getting there, right? Now you're talking about this in the world of action, not so much the world, the world of language. So what are you doing when you jump to conclusions? What's the similarity? You rapidly move from... In jumping is rapidly moving. Rapidly moving from one position to another. Thank you. That will be moving from one idea to another. That's it, right? You've somehow skipped over a bunch of chains in the argument, a bunch of steps in the argument you're trying to make, and you're just coming to the conclusion. Oh, it must be this, right? And the person who said don't jump to conclusions is saying you missed something. There's some discontinuity. You stepped out of the argument you were trying to make, and you missed a bunch of pieces, and now you're claiming that this fact holds at the end, right? Don't jump to conclusions. So there's a lot going on that's embedded in an embodied metaphor, an embodied idiom, if you like, right? Here's another one, don't look back in anger. Why look back? What does this idiom mean? And how is it connected to action like we just did for don't jump to conclusions? Viewing something that has already you've already viewed or something that you've already experienced. So why does looking back usually mean that you suddenly see something that you experienced a short time in the past? Okay. There's a, behind you. There's another action because you're moving, forward. you're moving forward, right? Humans tend to move this way, which means if you turn around and look behind you, you're usually seeing a place or a situation that you were recently involved in in the recent past, right? So don't look back on recent events and think low of them, right? Okay, let's, we've got a little bit of time. Let's play the embodied metaphor game. We'll stick to English because that's all I know. So uh, what are some other embodied idioms you can think of in English? Don't jump to conclusions. Don't look back in anger. They all have hidden within them very motoric words that communicate a relatively abstract idea. There's thousands of them. It takes a while to get going. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Yeah, okay, that's that's there. Yes, I guess. Counting is still kind of an abstract thing. Stop running your mouth. Stop running your mouth. That's a good one, right? You're starting to warm up to this task. Maybe not. <laughs> You've stalled out now. You're cooling off. Oh, yeah, my purpose counts for like a running nose. A running nose? Yeah, okay. I guess that would count. Yeah. Don't knock it until you've tried it. Don't knock it until you've tried it. That's a good one. Absolutely. I played this game a lot. I have thousands. What's that? Hold your horses. That's a good one, right? That also requires a little bit of historical cultural knowledge. Yes? Do you catch what I'm saying? Do you catch what I'm saying? That's a great one. Yes? Can I pick up what I'm putting down? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Excellent. They think it'd be like it is what it do. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I want it on the border somewhere. Sniff them while they're stepping in. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, all right, that's a good one. That, uh, that one I'm going to remember, okay. Don't take it lying down, right? So I'll, there's, there's thousands of them, right? You've got me tied in knots now with all your suggestions. Great game to play after a few beers on a Friday afternoon, so uh, give that a try. Okay, so there seems to be these lines of evidence from linguistics and neuroimaging that the way out of the trap of going round and round and round with symbols is that we're going to break this circularity by grounding symbols, remember this is the symbol grounding problem, in the soil of felt experience. So let's switch back now to robots. Here's an example. We have a robot which is behaving in pyrosim, for example. It's got touch sensors in its feet. This should sound like a pretty familiar situation to you. It feels pressure on the soles of its feet, soles of its feet, and suddenly it moves in such a way that all the touch sensors go to zero. And the moment the robot does this, it hears this disembodied voice out there in the void somehow say, J-U-M-P. This robot doesn't speak English. It just knows that whenever this pattern happens, it hears J-U-M-P. Who do you think it's hearing this from? Who is saying J-U-M-P? Remember the name of this project. The viewer or the viewers, plural, right? Remember that we are broadcasting the simulation to a Twitch channel, and there are a large number of observers who are watching it, and they are trying to help robots ground the symbols of human language in the robot's felt experience. So the robot feels this. The, cr the crowd of human observers sees this and says this. Right? If the crowd is patient enough and the robot does enough of this kind of thing, maybe the robot moves differently and this jump, this discontinuity in its touch sensors goes to zero here, and now it hears jump over here. Or maybe the robot jumps here and hears J-U-M-P over here. If the robot is learning over time, it should learn an association between this felt experience and this symbol, J-U-M-P. If sometime later, the robot is sitting quietly and you say J-U-M-P, what should the robot do? Right? It's a way of interrogating the robot. Does the robot understand the word jump? If you were to ask a linguist what it means to understand a word, you would get involved in a very lengthy conversation. From our point of view, we're making this very concrete. We're going to claim that the robot understands the word jump if when you say it, it does it. Right? That's it. The robot is demonstrating that it understands the relationship between this symbol and this experience. As I'm going to show you in the moment, uh, in a moment, Joey managed to actually ground this crowd proposed symbol. The crowd uh, did actually got the robot to learn jump. Hopefully, as this project moves forward into the future, if we can get the robot to ground motoric words like jump in physical experience, maybe we can turn this whole project into a recursive project where now the robot does something where it can start to ground motoric words in slightly less motoric words. Right? The word movement is more abstract than jump. How might the robot start to ground movement in jump in a similar way that it grounded jump in actual sensor motor data? So and we, remember we saw in the site project, in the site project it would have said jump is a specific exemplar of movement. Right? Maybe the robot grounds jump, it grounds go, it grounds turn left, left it grounds turn right, it, it grounds the symbol dance, it grounds a whole bunch of examples of movement and realizes that whenever it learns those specific symbols, sometimes the crowd also mentions another symbol. And this symbol always shows up, or shows up a lot of the time with jump, dance, move, turn, and so on. But this symbol doesn't show up with things like stay still, lie flat, don't move, and so on. 
right? So maybe it could start to understand what movement means by grounding it in jump and a bunch of other motoric words. Maybe if we keep going, eventually we'll have a robot that can ground increasingly abstract words in slightly less abstract words. Right? So at this point, we've left scientific evidence for how humans do it. There's a remaining hypothesis here that maybe this is how uh, humans do it, right? Maybe you learn, children learn, jump, don't do that, and so on. These, they ground motoric words, and then as they get older, or as you start to learn a foreign language, you start to learn more abstract uh, words. Okay, for those that are interested, as I mentioned, Lakoff has written a bunch of books about how language is tied very closely to action. One of his colleagues, Rafael Nunez, wrote another book called Where Mathematics Comes From which also demolishes the myth that math is sort of this abstract thing that is dissociated from the, the body. Right? Most of our mathematics is based on base 10. Why base 10? Right? It's a great book for those of you that are interested in math uh, or this idea of embodied cognition. Okay, so let's come back to the Twitch Plays Robotics project. We're clearly not going to finish it today, so we'll just get started. I'm going to, like I've done before, walk you through the experiment step by step. It's a relatively involved experiment, but I'm going to break this down into four pieces. The robot acts, the humans observe, the robots learn, and then to demonstrate to us that the robots have grounded language in action, they're going to make predictions. So the robot, as you'll see, see at the end here, is going to hear J-U-M-P, it's going to do something, and when it does something, we then ask the robot, hey robot, predict. If we show the crowd this symbol of human language, and we show the crowd what you did in response to that uh, symbol, do you think the crowd said you obeyed the command, or disobeyed, or obeyed the, the symbol, or disobeyed the symbol? And if the robot can predict then we know that it understands that word. If it hears jump and the robot crouches, the robot will say, I know that the crowd will think that I disobeyed that command. If the robot hears jump and the robot jumps, the robot will say, I know that the crowd will think that I obeyed that command. Make sense? OK, we've got two minutes left, so let's make a bit of progress here. Um, how do we set this up? Um, so we have. Uh, we have our simulation here, much like you have your simulation here, uh, the, the one that you've developed. We live stream the simulation to the Twitch uh, website, and the human observers watch the robot doing its thing. The human observers type into the chat window various pieces of chat. The master program collects all of that chat, connects that chat with that particular robot, and puts it in the database. Here's a video of the Twitch Plays Robotics Project in action. Uh, Joey ran this uh, last year. This was about eight hours into the experiment. Um, you'll notice here's our simulated robot. Here's the chat over here. And you'll notice that there are these two additional windows here. What you'll see in the top right window here is the crowd voting on which symbol to teach the robot next. At this point, there's one vote for crawl forward, one vote for walk forward, two votes for walk forward. So walk forward is now the symbol that is emitted or sent to the robot. So now, is the violet robot obeying the command walk forward? No. So hopefully, someone will vote for no. Maybe yes, maybe no. There we go. Two votes for no, the robot is disobeying the command, walk forward. Three votes, four votes. One vote for yes. Okay. All right, next one. The blue robot is still hearing the symbol walk forward. Is the blue robot obeying the command walk forward? Doing a dance. Doing something. Doing something. I don't know if I would call this walk forward. Let's see what the crowd says. No. Oh, three votes for yes right at the end there. OK. 
All right, you get the basic process. We'll continue on with Twitch Plays Robotics on Thursday. You have a quiz due tonight. Uh, have a good rest of your day.